So welcome very much to the session, The Art of Self-Management, How to Lead Yourself. And I'm delighted you're, you're joining us. Let me start here. Uh, I was very struck by a story uh, by one of my friends, a wonderful you know, younger leader I, I work for, I mentor her, she is um, based in southern Germany, very active and uh, is a mom of three children, is an author, church planter, and you know, very, very, very busy. And she was like on the go so much so that at one point she had this opportunity of going to the monastery and have a, you know, have a retreat for her own soul and heart and maybe just get some physical rest as well. And she had this appointment with a nun there. I believe it was a Protestant nun, I'm not sure. But anyway, so she had this encounter and she was somehow hoping that this nun is going to console her and is going to have, you know, pity on her that she's working so hard. But then the nun looked at my friend Yela and said, you have lost your home. What do I mean with that? That, that she has lost her center. It was all about running wild and mad for God and working so hard. But it was rather working for God than with him. And there is, and some, you know, that, that really, that story touched me very much. I thought it's a, it's a good reflection, you know, a reflective question for me, you know, do I work like mad for God? Do I feel that burden is on me and I have this maybe savior complex or can I also rest and say, God, I've given my best with your help and the rest I'm going to leave to you. So where is your home? Where is, where is your center? What, what do you base it on? And so, uh, I want to start with the uh, three um, quotes here from the Bible about looking after yourself. And I think, I mean, the, the indication that your interest in this topic, hopefully it's maybe for you, but also for others. And of course, the, ba the Bible is our foundation. And when I looked at, you know, various verses on, you know, Googling, using the Bible dictionary, what is out there looking after yourself, I was quite amazed actually of how many times, especially in the New Testament, it says, you know, look after yourself, look after yourself so that you can lead the others so that your, you know, flock won't perish. And so when I looked at, you know, if you're, if you're having your Bible with you or on your phone or so, it's worth looking up um, the various verses. For example, X 20, 28, you know, it says, you know, keep watch over yourselves. You know, watch, keep watch over yourself. It's very important that the flock won't uh, be led astray. Or oh, I've just opened here First Timothy 4.16 on my phone. And it says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. I mean, whatever that means with the saving, you know, I, I can't address now, but I thought it was really fascinating that in each case is with Acts and with First Timothy, you know, speaking here to a younger leader, you know, that, that we should watch our lives, that we are, as leaders, we are role models and we are, in some regards, we are copied by others, you know, by people who follow us. And so what is it that they see? Is that worth copying in that sense? You know, are we looking at ourselves so well? And then maybe uh, we can just go and um, uh, read Galatians. Let me just go to Galatians here. So brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. And then going down to verse 4. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. I mean, isn't that something we find so hard as leaders that, you know, it's watching ourselves and, and being watched, you know, and looked at, but also then, you know, that um, it says, you know, take pride in yourself only, that you're not starting to compare yourself. So some of the stuff I'm sharing with you, it is not about comparing and seeing how others do it. Or I even present some of my learnings also through my ELF mentoring, which I have received and uh, I have been able to sit at some of the, you know, feet from some of these giants of faith, which I find amazing. I met, I meet people, you know, at ELF, but it's that kind of, you know, how do they look after themselves and, you know, you know, how do, how do I do it well? And so 
there are four things I would like to look at with you. And there is um, a very famous uh, psychologist, uh, Christian uh, counselor, and um, his name is Thomas Harry. And he worked us through in four different regards, what does self-management, what does leading yourself really mean? So his first book was about the art of leading yourself. And his second book is then the art of leading others. But, you know, it starts with me. And so these are four things I would love, love to look at with you. And it says the first one is self-responsibility. One is self-declaration. And I realize that some of the terms maybe are not as English as they could be, but uh, I, I translated them and, and hopefully, you know, you get the meaning here. One is self-care and one is self-controlling. So let me walk you through what I mean with these four areas. So self-responsibility, you know, that I have this responsibility given by God to me and is a freedom, you know, to, to create. I'm not a puppet, you know, on strings where God is just, you know, you know, whatever, uh, directing me. But, you know, I have lots of freedom to create and to act upon something I've learned. Um, and then, you know, is I learn how to lead myself. So that's part of, you know, I am taking responsibility for my own life. And I also say yes to the responsibility for how I feel and how I behave. So, you know, I realized that as a child, you know, I thought I was always the one, you know, being blamed for something, maybe if my mom was in a bad mood. But then now I realize, no, I take responsibility for my own behavior, but not for the others. And this is, of course, it's a learning process. But it helps me to also then say no to other things. So in that regard, when I look at, you know, how are you leading yourselves? Um, a very important point in self-management is to know what are your inner convictions or what are your results. And uh, I had a fantastic session with Dave Paddy, the European director of Josiah Venture, uh, on these inner convictions. What are some of the results we take? And so, you know, when I look at, you know, the pioneer missionaries in the past, they, for example, had like no Bible, no breakfast. I mean, imagine waking up in the morning and not looking at your phone for the first time, you know, first thing in the morning. Is there, what are your, some of your inner results and convictions? And, and he said it is key for us as leaders to know and determine and actually write them down. And uh, when we look at Daniel, which I also put down here in our paper, Daniel 1, describes very clearly, you know, his results. And um, let me just go through with you to that verse because I thought it was fascinating. You know, we have Daniel 1 and, uh, you know, they're in exile with his friends. So Daniel 1, you know, you see the story, they're brought before the king and so on. And then the king is ordering, ordering them various things. He's looking for the best people. Um, you know, from the royal family, the nobility, whatever, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of yearning and so on. And then they're made to drink and eat and whatever. And then in verse eight, it says, you know, that Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine and asked, you know, for permission not to defile himself. himself. And so, the question is, what are some of your inner convictions, you know, you won't let go because that is so important. And I realize even, you know, when there are shakings uh, coming for us as leaders, these inner convictions are very, very important because we hang on to them also in a crisis. And so I just give you my slide here. I'm actually just working on them. I started in November last year being very challenged as we study Daniel for a few days and say, okay, what are some of my inner results? So that also means if someone maybe goes against them, you know, it itches me. There's something there I'm reacting on and actually think, okay, they clash with my values. What have I seen in others which I so admire? For example, one of them is I met a millionaire in Northern Ireland. He sadly just died. And uh, he said to me, whenever I meet another person, uh, and, and I leave that person, I want that person to feel uplifted. So that's like one of my first ones here. I thought like, wow, every time you speak with someone, no matter if you disagree with them on any topic or not, 
you know, I have a resolve that I want them to live uplifted. I don't want them to be put down by my action, by my wording or whatsoever. So, and I realized, okay, actually to live discipleship and, you know, talk about mission, lifestyle and so on. I made this resolve again, inspired by someone else and I really felt God stirring my heart. So, okay, every year I go on an outreach. So last year I went to the refugee camp and I wanted to go again. So COVID-19 has just stopped me from doing that. But then finding new ways, how do we bless and how do we engage? So these are some of my things just to maybe inspire you. What could it mean for us? So can I encourage you with Dave Paddy's words, you know, write down your resolves and then check them regularly and see, you know, so what is out there? Do I still keep at it? You know, these are my, my values, which, you know, are hopefully, you know, biblical principles here and then put into action on my side. The next thing in the self management is the self declaration. So it's an announcement about who I am. So it's, it's based on my identity. You know, who am I in the eyes of God? And I'm a child. I, I'm, I'm his child. I'm loved unconditionally. So what does it do to me? You know, what do I say over, over myself? You know, do I look at that my teacher, you know, had said, you know, in the, when I was like, I don't know, 10 years old, you know, I and my twin sister were so dumb. We will never be, you know, able to speak any English and uh, we should just be put on a special needs school. And I think, wow, if God hasn't said that over my life, you know, who do I let determine uh, to speak truth over my life? And so it is again and again reading the word of God over our lives and defining, finding clarity of who I am and what's important to me. So uh, this is just a very simple sketch here, you know, the mindset of unsuccessful people and the mindset of successful people you know, is again, do I let others define me or do I take on responsibility and actions say, no, you know, God has given me all the power. He's strong in my weakness and I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I might fall down and I get up again. And as we say in German, I fix my crown again and I'm going to go and maybe stumble, but I'm going to go forward because it is with God's help, you know, I take decisions. I decide uh, and it's not other people deciding uh, over me. And of course, that's a struggle. It doesn't always happen straight away and straight through. But it is always again, I hope I get faster in recognizing who is determining me or not. So, for example, in that area, sometimes I feel, uh, honestly, I feel like a loser. You know, I think like, oh man, who am I? What have I achieved? What have I got together? And so on. And Bob Beale, uh, a wonderful, wonderful legend. And I, I attended my first year round mentoring group with Bob Beale for organization leaders. And he encouraged us. He said, for each decade, can you write down something where you were successful in? So as you can say, you know, as, oh, I, I jumped from a springboard, you know, by the age of 10. And so and I did, wow, I was 13, I did an outreach, I put it in. So it took me a few weeks and then so I go back and now I'm in my 40s already so I can add another decade here. And thinking, okay, sometimes, you know, Bobby encouraged us that when you feel like, you know, people are criticizing you heavily, especially maybe fellow leaders and the followers, you know, I think like, so it's good to remind yourself who you are in Christ, but then also maybe go, look, go and look at this list and actually Bobby, he carries some of it with him, you know, because some of Maybe, you know, you, you, you're not sure who you are and then realize actually with God's help, I was already able to do quite a bit. So, you know, create a list. This is a practical step in that, you know, for each decade, life milestones, whatever might be suiting you, but to remember, remember the goodness of God on your life and his faithfulness. Then the third self, care here um it is for third self is the self-care you know what who are my sources of strength that i live from you know and it should be my faith in god it should be good relationships friends and and people i can share life with my pain buddies you know what is when i experience hurt in ministry where where can i go to this is so important and i you know i i cannot be grateful enough 
for mentors in my life who have walked some of the very difficult journeys with me. And I say, I owe to God and to three guys who have really walked a very painful journey in leadership with me. So, you know, who is looking after me and the self-care is so important. And then of course, you know, keep in check, you know, that my, the tank of my spiritual life is constantly refit, you know, how am I doing with my time with God alone? You know, is that the first thing I sacrifice in my busy life? And I realized for some of us, these COVID-19 times are not the times where we have so much time on our hands. I know some of my friends, I feel like they're home already for seven weeks. They, you know, they get sort of paid, uh, but they can do whatever. And I think, whoa, what a luxury, you know, just to have that much time and they can do anything they want. But then I realized some of us are even busier than others. I meet so many pastors and leaders at the moment who are saying, before I worked like 120%, now I feel like I work 150 and even more because these times are very demanding on us. So how do we do self-care in such a situation? How do we look after ourselves? And so one of the questions in self-management is a question we need to answer. How do we rest well? You know, do you get energy from people or without? And so what I've learned in all of this leading myself well that I actually put down a lot of stuff on paper. And maybe you're the creative one and you can draw pictures or whatever. You put some post-its on the mirrors, you know, to remind you, you know, what does it mean to rest well? And also, how do you keep the Sabbath? I don't mean like the legal rhythm that it has to be the Sunday or the Saturday, you know, depending on your context. But how, what does Sabbath look like for you? And I realized I needed to find a way too for that because I'm traveling most weekends, except at the moment. And so I invest into young leaders in Europe and globally. So, you know, a Sabbath, you know, Sunday doesn't look to me like a lot of rest. So, I, you know, I find time in the week or when I travel, I always make sure that the next day when I'm home, I have time for myself, time to debrief, time to sit still with God and reflect. I don't want to go from one to the other, hurrying through life and feeling that, you know, that I am the savior. I'm totally not, you know, but sometimes I realize that I behave like that. And then the last one of self here is the self-controlling. So how do I make the best out of my family, my job, circumstances, and relationships? And, you know, how, how do I make use of all the possibilities given to me? There are so many opportunities out there. And ELF, you know, is offering amazing opportunities. All this mentoring, the year of mentoring programs, national conferences, and so on. But it's always, again, deciding what is, you know, working out the best, which is for your circumstance and not for, for, for others and you just copying others. But it's about how do we self-control and how are we able to say no to others? And I realize that part of self-control is that self-discipline. And uh, as I started running about two years ago, I really was struggling. I mean, I'm not a sportive person, but I, I was reading Second Timothy, wondering what does it mean to run well through life? And that was just coming out of a personal leadership crisis. I thought, what does it mean, you know, to, to run the race until the end? I want to die and still love God. I want to die and still love ministry. But so many actually do not make it. And so... Self-discipline is very, very important. And the hard thing is that the reward is only seen afterwards. You know, it is like, it's so much easier to open a package of crisps and eat it in front of the television. And that gives you this instant good feeling. But afterwards, you might feel bad. At least I do. <laughs> and I think, oh my goodness, this is another two hours run. Or, you know, do I start running and then I build up my muscles and then the reward only comes afterwards. And only after a few weeks, maybe I was like, oh, wow, I can actually do 10Ks now. Wow, I, I never thought I would. So per, part of that, the whole idea is, you know, thinking what, what motivates me as a leader in here? So in these situations where we are challenged on self-discipline and so on, you know, what is my motivation? Is that intrinsic, you know, or is it extrinsic? Is it someone stirring that from the outside or is it from the inside, you know, feeling that I'm, 
that I'm standing on a firm foundation of God and that though things will shake me, the outside might never be as important, that it doesn't matter how many people applaud me after I think I did a great sermon or even after today delivering a workshop, that in the end, it doesn't matter how many people will applaud me because I've done, you know, I've followed a calling, I have followed a request and I'm giving my best. So looking at self-management also from the other side, you know, you can think of what about your cognitive, you know, what about your emotional, what about your behavioral or what about your physical? So I would like you, you know, to put down on paper for you, how do you manage well in these various areas? What do you do emotionally? What do you do behavior wise, you know, physical, you know, um, I said, for, for example, for me, I want to go 10,000 steps each day. So some of that's very rainy and windy and whatever, but we made it through the winter and I'm very happy. And now I can't even imagine not doing it. It sort of gets me, you know, out of the house. A cognitive, what are the books or podcasts which inspire you? You know, do you take time to read and, 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 and you know, rest and, and get, you know, new energy, uh, new inspiration? So really it is down to us, how desperate are we for this? And what are some of the choices we need to make? And so life is all about choices. And especially in self-management, you know, leading myself, I need to make a lot of choices. And so also the willingness to let go of some stuff, maybe the willingness to refocus and the willingness to maybe take on another ministry or another role. So the question, in here you know for us as leaders you know is will we finish well uh, when paul was you know challenging timothy and said you know i want you to run the race and be like an athlete that you are concentrated on the big goal and uh, lausanne uh, the ceo director of lausanne michael o, he said uh, i think that was probably four or five years ago at the at the forum he said 60 percent of all leaders do not finish and when I heard it, I was like, wow, this is incredible. This is, this is too high. I, I, I can hardly bear this number. This is just unacceptable, you know, so high. And then, of course, in business, even it's, it's even more I read in a Harvard magazine. But if that is the statistic, I don't know what it is, you know, um, is it just for the American? Or what is the European number? But anyway, it is too high. And I realized a lot of leaders around me actually sadly finished. And we have the biggest breaking point for leaders is between the age of 35 to 45. So congratulations if you're over 45 and you're still in business, loving God and running the race, then this is great. And probably also down to your self-management. And I brought you three bridges to maybe just exemplify here. So this is a beautiful bridge in Eastern Germany one of my dreams to go there and visit and walk across the bridge so it's still functioning this br bridge is in use uh, though it's just for passengers but it's totally beautiful in saxony and it works the next bridge i've brought uh, with me is a bridge uh, i heard someone say that we have more than two thousand of such bridges in germany when i heard this i thought oh my goodness the german engineering how oh my goodness this is this is bad you know, investing so much money, building bridges, and then, oh, the farmers miscalculated, or they didn't want to give up their land, or something happened. So when you Google, maybe, for your country and bridges, it might be interesting how many things you will find in nature somewhere, but it's not connected. And some of I wonder how much we invest into us. If I think of being a leader, I'm a bridge for people, you know, from God to people. I'm um, you know, sometimes channeling them through and hopefully not being in the way. But often there are many leaders I have met or who have been so broken and there's no connection anymore, no connection anymore to God and neither to people. And then I brought you my last bridge here, which is from the Honduras, uh, when a very, very strong uh, hurricane came. Um, it completely reshifted the river. So the bridge stood, so it left, it's a legacy out there. But as you can see, the river has taken a different tour. 
so it no longer is connecting the places. So what can we do as leaders not to run dry and not to, to be bypassed, you know, just because we're not alert to the Holy Spirit. So can I encourage you to be more like that Eastern German bridge in Saxony and saying whatever it takes, you know, walking with God, leading myself, I want to be that bridge which is still in function until I die. And it's so important um, that we, that our identity is defining our position. It is not, you know, what I do, it's not my business card, it is not how important people think I am or not, but it is identity uh, based upon God and what he thinks of me. And then secondly, it is the calling. And uh, Greg Pritchard walked me through that, you know, he's the director of ELF. And that was, for me, that was so key of understanding that it's not my position which tells me who I am, but it is my identity. And the identity is not man-made, it is God-made. And so looking at this, you know, is the question of my competence and my character. You know, when I have very strong skills, but my, I don't work on my character, I can become very, very, very arrogant. Or if my character is in good shape, but I don't do anything on developing my skills, I might have the tendency to rather be very exhausted and even be leading to a burnout. So how do we look after these two things, you know, competence and character? Both of these are like muscles we need to constantly stretch and work on. There are motivations for us as leaders. And, um, you know, you see some of the stuff here, responsibility, the work itself can be so motivating, the advancement or maybe promotions. And then we have the motivational killers. And it is so always again important when we realize things are not going good, why are they not going good? Is it because I'm out of touch you know, with God? Am I out of touch with people? What kind of bridge am I? And so what I would love to encourage you, and if you haven't done it yet, I would love to encourage you to have a mission, inst mission statement for your life. In self-management, when you, when you search on that topic, it's this, like, like one of the number one keys of leading yourself well is knowing where are you heading. And so it is discerning how do you encounter the needs. You know, Aristotle, as he said, where the needs of the world and your talents cross, there lies your vocation. So what is your vocation? What is it that God uniquely implanted on you to make a change somewhere what is it that and can you write it down can you name it can you name your main giftings and so it's saying you know a mission statement should contain you know some it should you know it should be you know defining who you are as a person it should mention your purpose and then also um you know how you pursue that purpose why it matters so much to you so, I mean, I would love to get, you know, hands up here and saying every one of you has got it, you know, that would be amazing. Uh, because that actually, um, as I read again on preparing the session, we say it is the number one thing because it helps you to also say no to many other things. For example, I, um, there is a, it's a very famous book and, and a movie out there, Tuesday with Maury, it's based on a, a true story. But this Professor Maury on the right said he was dying. So his former student went up to see him every Tuesday and flew in to see Maury. And um, Maury uh, had a very profound thing. He said, if you know how to die, you know how to live. And I thought, this is so much scripture, you know, that if you die with Christ, you know, he is our gain. So whatever we're going to focus on, is it worth dying for in that sense? You know, I know where my eternity lies in uh, and not in, in my achievements and whatsoever. So for example, I brought you my statement. When I was 21, I wrote my statement, so you can calculate how old I am now. But, and it is not you know, perfect, it doesn't have to be. It took me a few weeks to work on this. I was like looking at my main giftings, like recruiting and training and equipping, especially young people. I want them to love God until the end and to worship him. So then I sent it to my mentors and I said, you know, does that sort of reflect me who I am? And this has helped me heaps. 
over the last, I don't know, four years or so, um, since I left the ministry and went to serve with the Lausanne movement and others, you know, I have, I've had, I mean, amazingly, I don't know why, but I had so many offers and requests and could you maybe become a mission director and, you know, could you join this board and that board and so on. And I realized actually this mission statement has really saved me from A, from burnout, but also from doing maybe the wrong stuff you know, which I'm not really gifted in. I thought, my passion is for young leaders. So I don't want to serve in an old people's home, whatever. It is not my cup of tea, what I'm called to. So then finishing off, just um, a few things. Um, I was encouraged through ELF, and which I met through some of my mentors. It is, you know, looking back on your 65th birthday, maybe. Hopefully uh, you're not that old now. Um, and when you look back and you hopefully have a very fulfilled life, hopefully, because the statistics say that 60% of leader, as leaders and people in general are not happy with their lives. So now is a chance today to think like, what does it mean for me to have a, you know, a fulfilled life? What does it mean for me? Even my status doesn't define me, my gender doesn't define me. What does it mean to have a fulfilled life? So if I would die today, how satisfied? Would you be with your life because that gives you again the perspective of looking back and saying you know no actually it is time to stop something it is time to start something or another one is mapping out your lifeline you can look at your lifespan and actually mark some of the most historic pieces in your life you can add uh, names of leaders who have been so important on your journey people you admire what are you admiring about you know what are some of the values maybe that drove that was attractive to you so you can either do that you know map out your lifeline in a very sort of you know uh, mathematical sort of uh, area or you can also draw your river of life someone tried to draw the river of life for, of jesus and saying you know this is how it looked like maybe for him how, how could it look like for you and maybe you're some of your creative uh, assets in your brain or uh, what my friend Ayila when I mentioned about her having lost her center she uh, wrote a book then on that you know on, on rediscovering her center rediscovering her home in God and she painted this landscape and she said you know when she encourages us to do sort of the same look at catastrophes in our lives maybe sources or you know look at the fruits uh, look at the garden where maybe are some, you know, the funeral happened, maybe where have some of my dreams died and just put it out there and then have God's view on it and pray into some of the stuff because they determine very much how you re react in situations. And so this is my last picture and then I'm happy to get your feedback or hear questions and so on. Um, this is a very uh, wonderful flower to me. I, I got to know it uh, last year uh, from South Africa. It's, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the story, but it's that flower only which comes through ashes and burn. So, and it's the first flower and it only flowers when it has actually seen the fire. That's why we call it the fire lily. So some of the fruit can only come out of the burn and out of the ashes. So what is some of the fruit you can gain also through stop, stopping some stuff, through starting some stuff, which couldn't happen if you wouldn't have the courage to let go and let God do the rest here. Yeah.